Right. Good afternoon. Um, Philip, can you just confirm that you can hear me? Because um, I haven't I got any. You can. Very good. I hope everyone else can hear me too. Good. I haven't got the image that I expected on the screen. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, so, as you know, on the 20th of October, the long, too long awaited decision of the Supreme Court in Brownlee was delivered. Uh, the case itself is a cross border fatal accident and personal injury case. But the, uh, the two issues which the Supreme Court decided are very important for all cross-border civil litigation. So Philippe Kuhn and I will be discussing the case this afternoon. Um, first, trying to explain exactly what was decided on each of the two issues, but then widening the discussion to consider some of the uh, key implications for cross-border litigation. Um, and when we do that, Philip will concentrate mainly on the ramifications for commercial litigation, and I'll concentrate mainly on the ramifications for cases based on injury, death or property damage. Um, we are, of course, happy to take questions. There is a Q&A function. Uh, we will probably take those questions at the end. Um, of the talk, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, and I should say that the slides will remain available to you. Um, and that, um, in fact, the slides and a recording of this talk will be sent out to you in the next few days. So you may feel that you don't need to worry too much about making notes. Um, when we deal with the questions, we won't identify the um, people asking the questions, even if we happen to know them quite well. So uh, that's no uh, rudeness. That's simply GDPR. We are told that we should not identify the people who are asking the questions. So uh, Philip is going to be operating the slides. I'm going to ask him to move them on. Um, and so could you, Philip, go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, now. The, the, the facts giving rise to the Brownlee case are, are pretty well known and, and relatively simple, if extremely sad. The, the eminent international lawyer, Sir Ian Brownlee, was on holiday in Egypt with his wife, Lady Brownlee, and their family. Um, they took an excursion and there was a crash in which Sir Ian was killed and Lady Brownlee suffered personal injuries. Lady Brownlee then brought a claim against the hotel. It's brought in tort and in contract. Uh, and there were three categories of damage she was seeking. One was damages for her own personal injury. Um, one was for bereavement and dependency as Serene's widow. And the third was on behalf of the estate. Um, of Sir Ian as his executrix and the applicable law was Egyptian law for all cases and importantly the case the proceedings had to be served on the defendant Egyptian hotel in Egypt. Um, thank you. Now I think the easiest way of identifying the issues in the case is to remind you of what the test is for service out of the jurisdiction, what a claimant who is seeking permission to serve out of the jurisdiction must show. There are three elements, essentially. And the first is a good arguable case that the claims fall within one of the jurisdictional gateways in Practice Direction 6B, paragraph 3.1. So the first issue in Brownlee was whether the claim in tort met this test. Um, there, there was, at least by the time the case reached the Supreme Court, no dispute that the claimant contract did. Second thing it's necessary for the claimant to show to get permission to serve out is a serious issue to be tried on the merits. And this second issue um, was in play in the Supreme Court. And the issue was whether the claims in both contract and in tort met this test. And the third thing is that England is the appropriate forum for the trial and that the court ought to exercise its discretion to permit service out of the jurisdiction. 
Now, by the time this case reached the Supreme Court, it was accepted that this test was satisfied. But you'll see that actually we will want to discuss the discretionary forum decision that the court makes because it's brought into sharp focus by the um, decision on issue one. Um, thank you. So issue one, I'm, I'm going to deal with this and Philippe's going to deal with issue two. Um, the, the, essentially, the way I've described the issue is how wide is the tort gateway? Well, the, the, um, the words of 3.19, the relevant words are set out there, that the English court has jurisdiction for over a claim which is made in tort where damage was sustained within the jurisdiction, the words in bold. Um, B gives a separate ground, but we're only concerned with A at the moment. So clearly the, the death and the injuries happened initially, they happened in Egypt. Um, but when Lady Brownlee returned to England where she lived, she continued to suffer the consequences of the injury. She continued to suffer the bereavement and the loss of dependency. And the question essentially for the Supreme Court is, is that enough to amount to damage sustained within this jurisdiction to found the jurisdiction of the English courts? So does the damage have to be the initial or direct damage which happened in Egypt? Or does persisting or consequential damage suffice? Um, and the decision of the majority was that the wider interpretation wins. So any substantial damage will suffice, any damage which is more than minimal. Um, so, for example, the continuing pain and suffering, um, or indeed it could be a remarkably wide gateway if one imagines someone injured who doesn't even live in England and is injured in a country other than England, but comes to England for medical treatment and pays for that treatment here, then potentially at least that is damage which could found the jurisdiction of the English court. Um, so, and as you will see from that example, it, it's possible in theory, at least, even to select the jurisdiction of the English court by coming to England and suffering some of your damage here. Um, so it, it obviously has potentially a very wide effect. And the complaint, one of the complaints of the defendants, which found favour with Lord Leggett, but not with the majority, was that it will too easily allow English claimants to obtain the benefit of home court jurisdiction. And the majority um, were of the view that that risk can be allayed by the use of the discretionary power to stay a claim, even though it passes through the gateway. And that way, they said, a sufficient degree of connection between the tort and England can be established and England won't be trying cases which have only a very slender connection with the jurisdiction. Um, thank you. So the, the, the next slide shows the difference that that makes from the European rules where the only jurisdictionally relevant damage is the, the uh, direct damage. But of course, we've left Brussels one now, um, not much sign of us getting into Lugano, but the divergence from European rules continues by this decision on the domestic rules. Um, so, Thank you. I, um, before handing over, I just want to look at the dissent of Lord Leggett and, and that not, or at least not only, because it, it's always interesting to see the, the great ones falling out, um, but because the dissent of Lord Leggett, as well as being quite powerful, does point to some of the practical difficulties for those who are engaged in cross-border civil litigation that the uh, decision of the majority can give rise to. Um, as Lord Leggett said, the wide test accepted by the majority effectively makes residence in England a path through the gateway. Indeed, he um, rather colourfully said it wasn't a gateway so much as a, 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 a wide invitation to everyone to bring their claim in England. And he regarded that as contrary to principle. And importantly, he regarded the forum known convenience jurisdiction, the discretionary jurisdiction, 
to stay a claim if it would be more appropriately tried elsewhere as not being the appropriate mechanism to ensure the necessary substantial link between the, the tort and England. And we'll look a little more at the problems that that control mechanism gives rise to. Um, good, well, I think, uh, Philippe, I'm gonna hand over to you now to deal with the, uh, the commercial litigation implications of this first issue. Thank you, Bernard. I mean, the, the starting point is Brownlee is a case on fairly typical facts involving the Egyptian equivalent of what would be a tortious negligence action in England. The reality for commercial litigation is that where you can't rely on the uh, gateway six, gateway dealing with the dispute or relevant claim being governed by English law, where there is a mix of English law and foreign law, um, the problem tends to arise in economic tort cases, which are predominantly civil fraud claims, but also cartel damages and other claims where there is often solely or predominantly a foreign law element, or in the banking context, when dealing with specialist regulatory or financial services legislation, um, often a combination of English and non-English rules, and also in the construction and energy sector, where there's often a combination of contract and tort law, although that particular field is probably less affected by Brownlee because um, there's already a separate gateway for A, which we'll touch on a bit later, which allows you to um, almost tag on a tort claim onto a contract claim um, where that gateway is made out. Um, Lord Leggett's dissent is, is very helpful in highlighting some of the tensions between the majority's approach in Brownlee and the economic tort case law that has developed in particular. And he goes through a number of authorities at Paris 184 to 190 of, the, of his decision. And it's well worth reading those paragraphs to get some of the relevant citations. One to highlight is a fairly recent court of appeal decision called Eurasia Sports Limited and Psy, where the Court of Appeal had accepted that um, the mere fact of financial loss being sustained in England is insufficient. Now, that, of course, was on the back of uh, Marinari and other European cases, um, but at least as far as economic torts were concerned, that was well settled and didn't appear to cause um, significant issues, predominantly, um, I would say, because of the reliance on the necessary and proper party gateway, which um, will come, come on to a bit later in this talk. Um, something to think about when looking at Brownlee in the economic tort context is how the widening of gateway 9A dealing with damage, the direct indirect damage dis distinction, has a knock-on effect on the wider coherence of 9A and 9B sitting together in economic tort cases. And there's already a fairly recent Supreme Court decision in JC, G, JSC, PTA Bank and Krapunov, which was a case about unlawful means conspiracy arising from alleged breach of, well, the breach was established of uh, court orders leading to contempt. And one of the issues in that case for the Supreme Court was whether the place of the conspiratorial agreement um, could, could be relevant. And while strictly a, a gateway 9B case and also arising from the application of the Lugano Convention, um, I, I would suggest that there's certainly room for future litigation as to the boundaries of Brownlee, Krapunov and other cases and overall what the conventional analysis in these sorts of economic tort or economic loss cases is. There was some recognition of that tension in the majority judgment delivered by Lord Lloyd-Jones um, 
um, although he dealt more generally with economic loss cases, not, not limited to the economic torts themselves. Um, the other point, as I alluded to a moment ago, is whether the expansion of this tort gateway will lead to a shift away from the really long-standing reliance on English anchor defendants, particularly in civil fraud claims, be it English shell companies or um, English proxies or associates, often controlled or directed by um, UBOs or other individuals or entities in other jurisdictions, which wouldn't themselves have a very clear nexus with England. Um, there's some useful Court of Appeal guidance in the case of Kolomoisky um, dealing with um, the Brussels equivalent, or in specifically the Lugano equivalent in that case, of the necessary and proper party gateway. As, as we all know from experience, these necessary and proper party gateway um, arguments tend to be very fact sensitive and um, lead to considerable difficulties. And that factors into the forum non-convenience analysis as well. Um, just to conclude on this, the expansion of the tort gateway itself is probably an additional tool for claimants alongside the necessary and proper party gateway. It's probably not something that you should seek to rely on as the only argument because all things considered, you may well fail on forum and convenience because of the lack of other connecting factors and you may end up with a costly jurisdictional challenge and may well lose at an early stage. Um, with that, over to you again, Bernard. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Yep. Uh, um, okay, so if you're in the realm of personal injury, property damage, uh, litigation, what, what does Brownlee mean? Well, it, it is potentially a big deal. And of course, those who are involved in this kind of litigation will immediately see why that for a long time now, there has been a very claimant friendly jurisdiction available to the English courts under um, the interpretation of the special rules for matters relating to insurance in Brussels one that the uh, Court of Justice came to in the Odenbright decision in 2007. Uh, it widened that or it, it interpreted that set of rules as permitting uh, an injured person to bring a claim against the tortfeasor's insurer in the injured person's home country. And, and it's certainly my experience that the, the majority of cross-border personal injury claims brought in England over the last decade or so have been based on that Odenbright jurisdiction. And, and that's been lost since Brexit because there's no equivalent in the domestic jurisdiction rules. And here with Brownlee, you have a decision of the Supreme Court which potentially allows claimants to start to build a claimant friendly jurisdiction in personal injury claims again. Not, of course, identical to the Odenbright jurisdiction, but in most cases of any significant personal injury. Uh, somebody who's resident in England who's injured abroad will come back and will still carry with them some damage. So the gateway can be got through in many cases. So a potential advantage for claimants, but, 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 not quite as simple as that. Um, Philippe, if you could just move on, thank you. There, I just want to touch briefly, um, and the slides give a little more detail, but I want to touch briefly on two areas of danger for claimants trying to exploit the uh, Brownlee decision and, and two areas that any defendant faced with what looks like an attempt to found the jurisdiction of the English court and the claim without much connection to England, um, areas that defendants will want to look at closely. The first is the possibility that the English court will simply refuse jurisdiction, even though the case gets through the gateway on forum known convenience grounds. And the second one, which will be very fact specific, but uh, in some cases you will have to consider whether any judgment you get at the end of a 
claim where jurisdiction has been founded on Brownlee will be capable of enforcement if the defendants don't have any assets in this jurisdiction, but only in the, uh, the, the foreign country in which the claim might um, arguably have been brought. So um, if I could briefly consider the forum known convenience um, issue first. Uh, as you'll know, the European rules of jurisdiction are essentially non-discretionary. In, in, in most situations, if a claimant brings the case within one of the jurisdictional rules in the Brussels or Lugano um, conventions, then the court in which that claimant starts the claim will try that claim to a conclusion. Um, the, the English common law rules of jurisdiction, however, um, uh, have a large element of discretion um, since, well, since well before the Spiliada, but codified in the Spiliada, the English courts have recognised clearly the discretionary power to stay a claim um, it, it, to be tried in another country if the court decides it may be tried more suitably in that other country for the interests of the parties and for the ends of justice. Um, if you have to serve out of the jurisdiction, which you mainly will in the kind of cases that Brownlee can get you through the gateway with, uh, then it will be for the claimant to establish that England is clearly and distinctly, not marginally, but clearly and distinctly, the more appropriate forum. Um, if you serve as of right within the jurisdiction, then the burden will reverse and the defendant will have to show that the other forum is clearly and distinctly more appropriate. Um, so that, that is a, a potentially very significant issue. If we could just go to the next slide, Philippe, thank you. Um, so typically the, the, the issues that the court will consider, it's a, an unfettered discretion to be exercised in the light of all the circumstances as to where the most appropriate court is. But typically the court looks at the domicile of the parties, the location of witnesses, location of documents, applicable law, place of the tort. But it is all very fact sensitive. So if there are no significant legal issues in the case or, or, or only very simple legal issues, then the applicable law won't be a very strong factor pointing one way or the other. If, as in, for instance, most road traffic accident cases, looking at liability, there are precious few documents, then the location of the documentary evidence may not be a very significant feature. Um, so the, the weight given to the factors varies according to circumstance. And of course, one can look at these things always in more than one way. Um, two judges with the same factors may give them different weight and reach different conclusions. So there is real unpredictability in foreign known convenience applications. They can be expensive and quite lengthy. They will often, for example, require some evidence of the content of the foreign law that the court will have to look at to see whether it's a big deal or a little deal. Um, and you, you can spend tens of thousands, and I, I dread to say, but in some cases you can spend hundreds of thousands on a forum known convenience application, which uh, in, in a um, uh, tens or hundreds of millions of pounds claim may not, may be well worth the investment, but of course a lot of personal injury claims are not that kind of claim. So a, a view will have to be taken early by claimants on whether the risk is worthwhile. And then the second point is the enforcement point as I say, you may need to enforce any resulting judgment abroad. Um, so the time you need to think about that is before you start proceedings if you're a claimant. Um, now that we're out of the Brussels regime and there's precious little sign of us getting into the Lugano regime, as you probably know, that, that um, application by the UK government has rather run aground on opposition from the Commission and whether we can gather enough goodwill from um, um, any other EU body to, to, uh, to get their support, I do not know at this stage. So we, we would assume that the common law rules apply for the foreseeable future. That will tend to mean that if you're trying to enforce in a foreign country, you won't be 
obviously trying to enforce according to the simple Brussels procedure, but according to whatever the domestic um, enforcement rules are of France or Poland or wherever it may be. And, and But one of the common threads running through enforcement rules is wh where the defendant did not consent to the jurisdiction of the English court, um, does the requested court, so the foreign court, which is being asked to the foreign country, being asked to enforce the English judgment, do, do, does the requested court recognize as valid the basis on which the English court sees jurisdiction? Um, and yeah, if you could go to the next slide, thanks, Philippe. Um, I, I've just quoted a, a, a rule from the Hague Judgment Convention, and it should, I should really have put red flags and Lord Denning's red hands pointing at this because it's not in force. Um, but of course, it, it's the result of negotiation between many um, states parties to the, the, the Hague Convention. And so to that extent, it may be some guide as to the type of jurisdiction which is considered legitimate by countries which are parties to the Hague Convention. And, and if you look at the rule there, um, uh, they say the requested court can enforce a judgment in tort. So if the judgment rules on a non-contractual obligation, being the, the way tort is uh, referred to in all um, these types of conventions, it includes other things in addition to tort, but um, a non-contractual obligation arising from death, physical injury, damage to or loss of tangible property, and the act or omission directly causing such harm occurred in the state of origin. So in that case, the state of origin would be England for an English judgment, irrespective of where the harm occurred. So that, that's not very encouraging. It doesn't suggest that it, um, every country would necessarily regard the Brownlee jurisdiction as legitimate. Because there may arise a question where, um, say, a French court could have assumed jurisdiction in a corresponding case on Odenbright principles. Um, and so it would have been legitimate for that particular case to be tried in the claimant's country of residence. Um, but whether or not that saves the case, if they wouldn't regard the Brownlee basis itself as being valid, well, that, that's a question you'd need to ask a foreign lawyer. So. Um, uh, the, the, there are two fairly substantial clouds on the claimant's horizon. Philippe. Oh, yes, ground 4A. Do you, do you want to just mention that, Philippe, since you mentioned it, uh, it earlier? We thought we shouldn't let the, the session pass without at least reminding you of the existence of this ground. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a new ground. It, it wasn't in existence at the time of Brownlee 1, but it was certainly in existence by the time of Brownlee too. We don't know why, um, and there may be very good reasons for it, it wasn't relied on, but it's something to be aware of when um, there are concurrent or parallel claims that you can bring in contract and tort. Um, and the, the wording really is quite self-explanatory, although there may well be more case law on, on the precise application. Um, with that, I think over to issue two, and as a sort of health warning at the outset, this, this is quite a, an involved, on the face of it, an involved conflict of laws issue and may seem a bit esoteric, but as we can see on the facts of Brownlee itself and no doubt many other cases in the past and in the future um, of real relevance and at an early stage of the process. So this issue, which we've called the foreign law issue, is really about the circumstances in which you can fall back on what Lord Leggett's judgment, which is the key judgment on and the, indeed the unanimous judgment on this issue, um, distinguishes between the default rule and the presumption of similarity. And I'll explain what Lord Leggett and the Supreme Court mean by each of those terms, because there's been some inconsistency in usage over the years and in previous authorities. Um, the application of both of those um, is relevant to pleading and could, where successful, make your life easier 
especially at an early stage. And you'll see in a moment that there's greater sympathy for reliance on the presumption of similarity between English law and a foreign law at an early stage as opposed to trial. Um, before turning to Brownlee, I wanted to just cover some basic ground by way of background. Um, the starting point for a long time in the English courts has been that foreign law is not treated as law. Instead, the English court makes findings of fact as to the content of that law and then applies it. Um, that position for the arbitration practitioners tuning in is somewhat alien because in, in international commercial arbitration and other forms of arbitration, each national system of law and private and public international law are seen as equals. Um, the English court doesn't approach it in that way. And for that reason, the norm, at least in modest, moderately complex cases, is for there to be some expert evidence on foreign law, um, caveats being urgency, but really quite exceptional urgency, perhaps on an urgent freezing injunction application involving some foreign law issues, um, or in, as Bernard was saying earlier, extremely straightforward um, accidents. But even then, there's, there's a lot of scope for complexity on closer analysis, and Brownlee illustrates that. Um, this, I think, I'll, I'll leave for you to read in your own time, but it's, it's a summary really adapted from the Dicey chapter as it stood pre-Brownlee, um, and it, it goes through the point of having to plead and prove matters of foreign law and the importance of expert evidence and what it should address. Um, turning straight to the decision in Brownlee then, um, Lord Leggett really distinguishes very clearly between what he calls the default rule and the presumption of similarity. Um, he describes the presumption of similarity as a rule of evidence and one that allows you to proceed absent better evidence from the premise that English law and the foreign law are similar or identical in content as far as the present issues are concerned, perhaps on a jurisdiction application. Um, by contrast, he explained that the default rule is not about establishing the content of foreign law, but is a fallback position where there isn't any foreign law pleading. The English court has to apply some foreign law, but as we'll see in a moment, um, there's quite a limited scope for falling back on that default rule. And the rationale was explained, and I'll leave you to read that for yourself. Um, importantly, the reminder at 116 of the burden of proof, and that burden of proof extends to showing that one has a good claim or defense under the relevant foreign law, where foreign law is being canvassed by either party. And the presumption of similarity then was expressed to be subject to three limit limitations really. And we'll see in a moment the, the test that the Supreme Court um, has provided. The first is that there shouldn't be any significant differences between the relevant legal systems um, the second is materiality. Um, the court will look at whether there's going to be a difference in outcome between English law and the relevant foreign law. And the final point is that this presumption is always subject to having specific evidence that rebuts it. And the test, and this, this is a key takeaway from this session for all practitioners is expressed at 126 in fairly broad terms in the circumstances is it reasonable to expect that the applicable foreign law is likely to be materially similar to English law on the matter in issue and then there's some further guidance in parentheses there are then there is then in Brownlee some helpful guidance on when this presumption is likely to come into play. One factor is whether you're dealing with a civil or common law system, but 
the judgment makes clear that there aren't any hard and fast rules about that in terms of it not applying to civil law systems. Um, is it contained in a domestic statute? If so, Lord Leggett saw a distinction between codificatory, uh, codificatory statutes or codes and more specific local schemes of regulation. And the stage of proceedings is another highly relevant factor. And Brownlee, of course, was a jurisdiction challenge um, well before um, detailed evidence and far away from a trial. As one approaches the trial stage, there's a lot less scope for falling back on this presumption. And this really is sort of summarizing it. It's a fact sensitive test and it's always subject to better evidence on foreign law. Um, there's also an interesting discussion as to whether the existence of some expert evidence on foreign law means that there's no scope for the presumption to apply. Um, Lord Leggett dealt with that head on because he was a, a relevant point on the facts of Brownlee. And the answer is, while expert evidence narrows the potential for relying on the presumption, there may be gaps in it. And in those situations, you may still fall back on it, subject to the other caveats that we've already gone through. Um, briefly then on the facts of Brownlee before I hand over to Bernard for the uh, implications in PI and why the civil litigation, um, the default rule was held not to apply because English law, sorry, Egyptian law was squarely raised and there was therefore no scope. It would have been artificial for the English court to say, this is all a matter of English law. Um, everything therefore turned on the presumption of similarity. And ultimately we've got to remember that Brownlee was a second tier appeal to the Supreme Court. And the way the Supreme Court dealt with it was to say that the first instance judge's evaluation was fine or not impeachable, impeachable on an appeal, um, stressing, however, that it was satisfactory for the purposes of establishing jurisdiction. Um, the decision may well be different at the trial stage if there isn't, at that point, specific expert evidence on the relevant Egyptian law. Um, and Lord Leggett already identified some issues which certainly would become more contentious and probably outside the proper remit of the presumption of similarity moving forward to trial. And those included um, concurrent liability in contract and tort. And with that, over, over to Bernard. Thanks, Philippe, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to look at this issue from the perspective of, of, as I say, personal injury, fatal accident, property damage, litigation from a, for, for, from a very practical point of view. Um, so the, the, the decision is very welcome because I, I've noticed over the years quite a lot of uncertainty in the judiciary as to the precise scope of the presumption of similarity. It was usually not distinguished from the default rule. And having that clear distinction um, it is a helpful starting point. Um, but it, it isn't uh, still clear and simple as to how these things will work in practice. So the default rule, in other words, you apply English law when foreign law is not raised, essentially. Uh, it, it seems to me in the light of Brownlee that it, that it essentially is going to require agreement between the parties, either um, express agreement or no reason why it can't be tacit agreement in the sense of simply not raising it on the pleadings. Um, and that is something that I think practitioners in this area ought to consider. Now, we all know, for example, that there is strict liability for passengers um, and vulnerable persons involved in road traffic accidents under French law. And a claimant who has the advantage of that um, strict liability is not going to lightly give it away or you, you, you have very high awards of damages for bereavement equivalent to bereavement 
in Italian law for fatal accidents and no claimant in their right mind will give that away by agreement. But there are many, many cases in which the relevance of foreign law is far more marginal. Um, and it, it would be possible, for example, to agree um, or to plead that French law applies to liability in a running down case, but for the parties to agree to apply English law to the assessment of damages. Just as an example, my experience being that in many cases, although there are differences of detail between French and English law, if you have a substantial claim by the end of it, um, when you've won on the swings and lost on the roundabouts, the, the figures that you're looking at are not very different to the figures you'd be looking at under English law, but you've spent a lot of time, effort and money in reaching those figures by engaging foreign lawyers. So think of the default rule. Um, now, if the default rule, if, if you don't reach an agreement on the applicable law not being applied, as it were, um, the presumption of similarity is uh, there, um, but I think what the decision of the Supreme Court does is to make clear the uncertainty and the difficulty of seeking to rely on it to fill in gaps in your case. Um, so I, I've put there paragraph 143, there's no hard and fast rules for when it will and won't apply, which sounds to me very much like you could have egg on your face if you try to use it to fill in a gap and the judge says, no, I'm not going to let you. Um, more likely to be appropriate where the foreign country is a common law country for obvious reasons. But of course, most Brits injured abroad are injured in Europe and um, there are not many common law countries in Europe, indeed, apart from um, Ireland. I'm not sure that there are any. Um, so it may often not be relevant when the applicable law is European law. Um, the statutory question that Philippe raised, if, if the English law is found in a statute, it's much less likely to be assumed to be the same. But there, there are statutes like, for example, the Occupiers Liability Act, which gathered together and reformed some rather unsatisfactory strands of the English common law and, and effectively codified them in a statute which still follows broad principles of general acceptation in the law of negligence. So that, that, that's a more encouraging starting point than, for example, the electricity at work regulations or some fairly local and specific set of regulations with a territorial limit on their application, where I think you, you would have real difficulty in persuading a judge. Um, and then, um, finally, if you could, Philippe, just yeah, move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, it, it, I just want to draw your attention to what Lord Leggett said at paragraph 148 about how foreign law should be proved. And as Philippe has explained, the traditional method, um, indeed the only method that most of us are familiar with, is by expert evidence from a foreign lawyer. Uh, um, look at paragraph 148. Lord Leggett suggests that... Um, in this day and age, do we always need that? Isn't the internet a pretty powerful tool? Um, find the relevant law and deduce it, find it online and deduce it that way without necessarily using a foreign lawyer. And, and obviously as a matter of proportionality, that approach could have a lot to recommend itself. But I would just point <coughs> to uh, the risk of taking that approach. And if you do take it, I think you will want to have the imprimatur of the court at an early stage at the CCMC, effectively, because um, if you don't have a foreign lawyer to guide the court as to the implications of a particular foreign statutory provision, for example, you are going to end up with arguments between the parties as to the proper interpretation. And the interpretation of a foreign statutory provision is a matter to be derived from that particular foreign law. Um, so you might find yourself adducing material via the internet and still begging the court to apply the presumption of similarity when it comes to the interpretation of that provision. So I, I, I'm, I'm not for a moment saying don't use, don't follow up on Lord Leggett's suggestion because clearly uh, it has the option, it has the potential 
to be cheap and efficient as a way of dealing with litigation proportionately, but be careful in the circumstances in which you use it. Thanks, Philippe. Thank you, Bernard. Um, just very quickly then to run through some of the more commercial specific implications, although particularly the last point is, is of relevance across the board. It might be that one, one example that I can think of is um, a Ukrainian interest provision providing for 3% to run from a certain date. On the face of the provision, it seemed self-explanatory and we had Ukrainian co-counsel, but not necessarily a Ukrainian opinion specifically on, on that at an early stage. And that's perhaps a, a fairly mundane aspect of a much more complex case where you, you might take up Lord Leggett's suggestion. Um, the, the key points that I wanted to highlight is that really what Lord Leggett's judgment requires you to do, and this is my point three, identify which issues of foreign law may be relevant um, and make sure that at, as early as the pleading stage, you have competent advice on the content of that foreign law. Um, you can always explain it more fully in expert evidence in due course, but if you get it wrong at the outset, um, it's likely to lead to a lot of additional cost and expense. And in that respect, I don't think Brownlee really changes it very much. Where Brownlee assists you, and this is my point too, is in giving you a bit of protection if at a very early stage and perhaps under time pressure on an urgent interlocutory application, you haven't quite got all your ducks in a row. And it might be, and this is an example given in the judgment that you, you have the provision You've got some backup from co-counsel, but it, you haven't yet got um, an expert opinion on matters of statutory interpretation. And you can say that at least at, a, at the interim stage, it's safe for the English court to interpret the statute in the same way that it would an English statute. Um, it's also relevant to um, alternative pleadings. So, uh, if, for example, you have a, a choice between advancing a claim under English and or foreign law, um, Brownlee may help you on, on certain aspects of it, but again, that isn't an invitation to cut corners or not, bring, not to bring well-founded claims under that uh, foreign law. And it, it's quite common um, for these to arise in, in civil fraud claims in Russia, Ukraine, and other CIS countries. Um, and then the final point that I want to explore is what Lord Leggett means by um, the parallels between common law and civil law systems. So as Bernard said, there's a natural acceptance of the presumption being more readily available in relation to common law jurisdictions, less so with civil law countries, but there is some discussion of overarching principles. And the one case that he considered that I want to draw to your attention is a US Supreme Court decision called Cuba Railroad, which gives some examples such as conversion of goods, battery to the person, and very basic um, contract claims based on passengers um, as potential examples where across civil and common law jurisdictions, the basic principles are likely to be um, sufficiently aligned. Um, I think with that, we've, we've covered our um, content, I think over the Q&A now, Bernard. Yes, yes. Well, um, we've invited you to ask, ask questions. And if, if anyone wants to use the Q&A box to ask a question now. Um, we've still got a few minutes left and we're very happy to do our best to answer the questions. We, we've got a question um, relating to the Odenbright jurisdiction that I, I mentioned and um, the, the question of whether or not, so what one gets cases, I'm going to restate the question rather than simply read it out. 
but um, one gets cases in which one can't easily locate the foreign driver who has injured the English claimant. Um, and it's convenient to sue the insurer of that foreign driver who can, which can often be more easily located through the MIB or uh, 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 other mechanisms. And, and, and whether th that was one of the advantages of the, uh, the Brussels regime and the extent to which that's still available now. Um, so what I'd say this is if, if, you can, if you can get through the gateway, say you've got a case that would have been an Odenbright case, you're, you're, you're for a claimant, your client is an English resident, is injured in France, comes back to England, still suffering pain and suffering and loss of earnings, etc., and can get through the uh, Brownlee gateway, but you can't find the, um, the, the, the French driver that ran you down. Can you sue the insurer? And, and the answer is that, yes, you can, that the right of action against the insurer is a substantive right. Um, it, it, as, you, as some of you will remember, it was made obligatory for all members of the European Union to have a direct action against insurers for motor claims. And that was from the time of the fourth motor insurance directive, now in the sixth directive. Um, so forget about the UK, you will know that every country within the European Union does have such a right of action, a direct right of action against the insurer, you can be pretty confident of that. And under Article 18 of Rome 2, um, if the law of the tort or the law of the insurance contract contains a direct right of action against the insurer, then an injured party can rely on it. And of course, Rome 2, the choice of law, not it's a choice of law instrument, not a jurisdiction instrument, of course, but Rome 2 is retained legislation. So following the departure from the European Union, Rome 2 is still the, the law of England and Wales. So yes, you can indeed um, continue to bring claims against the foreign insurer in the circumstances in, in which you could have done so before Brexit. Um, but jurisdiction will have to be founded on Brownlee rather than on Odenbright. I hope that, that answers the question. Um, yeah, we, and then another question, um, burden of proof in foreign known convenience challenges. Um, so, Philippe, do you want do you want to deal with yeah. that? I think uh, um, I, I hope that you might be able to find it on a slide. But Philippe, you can answer it orally, and then I'll I'll um, refer to the slide. Thank you. Um, really, the, the the question is who who has the burden of proof on a forum non convenience challenge? And as Bernard explained earlier, there's there's a distinction in terms of when the point arises so if you can and the way to think of it is the first question actually is service do you have a right to serve as of right under the cpr or do you need permission to serve out um you know for service as of right might be um you you manage let's say in the commercial context you manage to catch your defendant at heathrow airport and you serve your claim form on them, say with the particulars, and you've timed this really well, technically that provided you comply with the CPR, you've served them as of right. They can still contest the jurisdiction of the English court on forum non-convenience grounds, but the burden is then on them. If in the more conventional case, you're dealing with foreign defendants who are indeed abroad and you can't serve them within the jurisdiction, um, you need to make a service out application and persuade the English court that you can rely on one of the gateways or several of them, and also that you would satisfy the court on the forum non-convenience or more discretionary grounds. Bernard, I'm not sure whether you yeah. want to add anything to that. No, no, I, except I think it's on the, the, the first slide, it's slide 14, the first slide, headed for known convenience, I think seeks to argue it that, that, that um, clearly and distinctly is the test. 
Um, and yeah, as Philippe says, if you have to serve out, burdens on you to show that England is appropriate, clearly and distinctly more appropriate than the foreign forum. But if you serve as of right, it's the defendant challenging jurisdiction that has to prove that the other forum is clearly and distinctly more appropriate than England. Um, OK, so another question. Brownlee refers to substantial damage. In other words, substantial damage being suffered in this jurisdiction. Would a fast track claim with a few weeks loss of earnings suffered in England be sufficient damage in the jurisdiction? Well, that, it's a good question. As I read it, um, and I haven't discussed this with Philippe, so he may, he may say, you're quite wrong, Bernard. As I read it, um, substantial is used in the sense that lawyers use it and no one else in the world does to mean more than minimal. Um, more than minimal damage will potentially get you through the gateway. I, I would say, that the less damage that is suffered in this jurisdiction, the weaker the link with this jurisdiction is likely to be viewed as being for foreign known convenience purposes. But I, I, my view is that um, it, it's as long as the damage is more than minimal, so a very low standard, it would be substantial. Philip, what's your view? <laughs> I, I agree with that. And, and this, this particular example is raised in a, a fast track claim. I don't really anticipate the court having too much sympathy or too much desire to engage in an overly complex analysis. And so I think Brownlee probably gets you there on all but the most extreme facts. Yeah. So the, so the next question is... Um, if an English court takes jurisdiction based on Brownlee, is there likely to be an enforcement problem if the defendant took part in the English proceedings? Um, Philippe, I don't know whether you've got any observations on, on that or not. I'm yeah, to have... I think, you know, as, as Bernard explained earlier, the relevant factor is probably going to be whether there was a jurisdiction challenge or not. If if they've submitted to the jurisdiction of the English courts, then I don't think without any challenge, um, I don't think there's much scope for later on in the enforcing court, certainly if it's an EU court, um, having regard to the, the grounds that are recognized under the Brussels regulation for them seeking to say that the English courts exercise of jurisdiction was in some way exorbitant or contrary to public policy, um, where, and I think this was the example that Bernard had in mind, they have contested the jurisdiction, but the English court dismisses that jurisdiction challenge. There may be more scope for this argument, but it'll depend on the provisions in force in the relevant um, enforcing state. Yeah, and I think that's the, that's the only thing that, that I would emphasize. I, I, I was trying to raise the type of issue which will typically arise in enforcement proceedings, but the actual rules will depend upon the rules of the country, the domestic rules of enforcement of the country in which you're trying to enforce. Um, and, and the extent to which, um, I mean, what will and will not be taken as consenting to the jurisdiction of the English court may, may potentially vary in different countries the extent to which you have to kick and scream or the extent to which you merely can ignore the proceedings, for example, may vary. Um, but again, unfortunately, it's an, an area in which I think, you know, Brownlee trying to simplify in some ways and, and reduce the need in all cases for foreign law. But I think enforcement is an area in which you may have to seek advice, certainly in some cases, before issuing. Um, and then will Mrs. Brownlee's damages be assessed on English law or Egyptian law? Uh, well, I, as I understand it, I think I can take it upon myself to answer that question, that the applicable law is Egyptian law and uh, under Rome 2, Article 15C, the assessment of damages now uh, in, in English law is taken from the substantive applicable law. So. The, the rules of law that will be used for the assessment of damages will be Egyptian law rather than, than uh, English law. And the claims also in, in contract, I should say, but 
the same essential rule that the, the assessment of damages for the contract um, is according to the law governing the contract itself. So it, it will be Egyptian law in, in either event, as I understand it. Um, thank you. Well, I, I see that it's six o'clock. Um, we, we were down for an hour. I, I, oh, the, um, uh, well, the, there is one more question, which is about the recoverability of legal costs in foreign jurisdictions. And I think what I'd, I'd have to say on, on that is that it very much varies. Very few jurisdictions have recovery of legal cost regimes which are as generous to successful parties as, as uh, England, but it, it, it is infinitely variable. And obviously when choosing where to issue proceedings, it's one of the factors that you'll want to take into account. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I think we don't want to overstay our welcome. So um, I would just um, like to say good night. And as I say, the slides and indeed a link to uh, a video will be made available to everyone who's signed up for this. So thank you and good evening. Thank you. Good evening.